Good morning. Hey, how's it going? Not too bad. How are you? I'm all right. Hanging in there, I guess. Yeah. How are things out there? Um, not that bad. So hospital volume is down across the board. They canceled elective surgeries. Uh, they set up a respiratory clinic. I mean, I spent like a weekend setting up a respiratory ER, uh, just adjacent to the ER that I normally work in. And we haven't even had to use it yet. Yeah. I went on an average of seeing maybe anywhere between 20 and 30 patients a day for a daily census. And now I'm seeing seven. Oh, wow. So, you know, for them to be hanging up these banners in town saying that we're war heroes and. You keep getting free food from local businesses. You know, I just, I don't think that's necessary. I don't feel like a war hero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I know that, uh, you know, this is my coronavirus experience as an ER provider is probably drastically different than that of a Manhattan. So. Right, right. But I mean, I think it's kind of typical of most of the states because I talked to Molly Marcus and she's at Cleveland Clinic and she's having a similar experience. There's, you know, obviously they're triaging people who have COVID out to another place, but there's no one really coming in the ER. Right. Yeah. I think the, uh, you know, it, if you look at kind of what the, um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see here. Two monitors. Let's try this one. Everybody should be able to see that now. And I'll go ahead and put it into presenter view. All right. Uh, is everybody able to see like the PowerPoint presentation? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So um, this is just going to be a quick lecture or presentation on a novel coronavirus case presented from the perspective of the emergency department. Um, not like your typical clinical medicine lecture, those are boring and you guys already finished didactic. So rather than inundate you with information that you now have the full capability of looking up yourselves, we'll go through a scenario of what it's like to essentially be a PA or a provider in the emergency medicine setting when a patient like this comes through the door and we'll kind of go through decision making points and we'll talk a, a little bit about kind of, uh, you know, what you're going to see in the field and just I assumed five months, but it looks like that might be longer due to the pandemic. Um, if you have questions, uh, you know, feel free to send those in the chat. Now I can't see the chat box anymore, um, but if there is one, then certainly feel free to uh, to chime in or ask, but we'll go ahead and get started. We'll monitor the chat for you too. Thanks. Uh, so. My name's Nick Tu. I'm a certified physician assistant from the class of 2018. Um, and I currently work in Lewiston, Idaho, which is just at the border of the state of Idaho and the state of Washington. Total population of my valley is about 70,000. So it's drastically different from a large city like Columbus, which has just about a million people. Um, I work much like a, a lot of my classmates when they left school with a provider group. So I'm not employed directly by the hospital. Uh, as of, I think two days ago, I now work for a group called sound physicians. They're located out of Tacoma, Washington. Um, and they're a physician founded group. And prior to that, I was working for a, a corporation called H and I, um, and they're located out of Austin, Texas. Um, but I was hired roughly 14 to 15 months ago to come work out here in the emergency department at the time. Um, it was an enticing offer because I do have family that provide surgical services here in the Valley and, you know, a job working in emergency medicine where there's a lot of variety was kind of a win-win for me. Um, there are caveats to working out in an area here. There's no Target, there's no Chipotle, no Chick-fil-A. These things do matter when you're trying to figure out where you're going to want to live, um, you know, in the next couple of months when you guys are out and working in the field. Uh, this is just a, a picture of, uh, of me and my sister-in-law. That's Coral. She's an ENT surgeon um, and kind of the setting of the Pacific Northwest. So you're looking at just kind of the physical activities that I get a chance to do out here that I did not have an opportunity to do back in Ohio. So 
basically, I already talked about the overview, um, and we'll end the, the lecture with some, some teaching points and a couple of interesting you know, cases that you'll see in the ER. And what my cohort really didn't get from the previous cohort was kind of a, uh, a short mentoring or tips and advice for people who are just going to, who are going to be graduating soon. And these are kind of like life pro tips that I think every, you know, soon to be certified physician assistant needs to have in line before you graduate, before you start having to worry about, you know, an income and paying back your student loans and what it's like to kind of go through the, the application and the interview process and what you should, the questions that you should be asking um, as you start your careers. And then there will be just Q&A at the end. Uh, keep in mind that, you know, I've forgotten a large chunk of what I learned in PA school but that's what up to date in the internet is for. So the case here will start with MIST. And if, if you guys aren't familiar with that acronym, MIST is basically a shortened truncated version of the patient's history. Um, it stands for, you know, mechanism of injury, symptoms and treatment. And for those of you that are going to be going into trauma, you'll be familiar with this acronym. Um, so, Typical day in the emergency department, it's in the afternoon, uh, EMS calls the charge nurse to let us know that they're en route to the ER uh, with a 47 year old female who is a healthcare worker at a nursing home that has known COVID-19 residents. Um, right now, if you look at the kind of epidemiology and the, the area that I work in specifically, we have the highest number of reported cases and the highest mortality, but there are also a lot of nursing homes here. So I think the mortality rate right now is about 28%, which in a vacuum looks abnormally high. But if you take into account that a lot of these patients are 65 years and older, are in nursing homes with DNR, DNI, and have a lot of comorbidity, then that makes the situation look less, uh, I guess, less scary. Um, so EMS is called to the scene here at the nursing home because the patient was suffering a syncopal episode and it quickly developed into a cardiac emergency. They applied the AED, and at that time, it had advice for a shock. EMS gets on scene. They provide two full rounds of high-quality CPR, and they actually had to shock the patient again and delivered a milligram of epinephrine before achieving ROSC. Um, when she comes to you in the emergency department, she is alert and oriented, and a safer tachycardia, she's hemodynamically stable. Um, but she's in severe distress. She's complaining of chest pain. She's short of breath and she's complaining of weakness and she's frantically saying to you, don't let me die. Now, this is likely due to the fact that she had just rode the lightning twice uh, with the AED and that she fainted. Um, and this is probably a new experience to her. IV access has already been established by the paramedics and she's getting a liter of crystalloid fluid uh, running at a standard rate. Um, you're looking at the EMS rhythm strip, which is not very exciting. So surprisingly for a patient that essentially went into an arrest scenario or arrest situation, there's no prolonged QT. Uh, there's no ST segments that are indicating that she's infarcting and she doesn't have any hyperacute T waves or any abnormalities that would flag you initially for worrying about a cardiac issue, uh, save, save for the fact that she had to get shocked twice and get epi. So this is uh, your physical exam. Um, I always hated reading these things during callback days because they weren't highlighted with the information that's pertinent and information that I care about. So obviously me being in the emergency department, um, I only care about what it takes for me to, to get to the diagnosis and determine if the patient is sick enough to be in the hospital, sick enough to the point where I can deliver treatment and discharge them or send them home because they should not be in the ER. Um, so go ahead and review the physical exam, but she's tacky, which we already discovered. She's got decreased lung sounds on the right with some rails and she's diaphoretic. Other than some anxiety, uh, nothing else really, you know, popping out on the physical exam. And yes, my neuro exams are terrible, but my excuse now is that I'm in the ER. I don't need to provide good neuro exams. Either you're going to go into the donut of truth or you're not. That's what we call the CT scan. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so before we talk about the differential and what orders you want to uh, start getting for the patient, don't be the type of person that, you know, if we were in lecture, four people right now would raise their hand and say, she has novel coronavirus. Well, yeah, of course she does. That's the name of the lecture. 
Um, and that's kind of the topic that we're talking about. But let's keep in mind that, you know, when she was at the nursing facility, she technically died for a little while. And we need to make sure that we investigate that as well before we start getting excited about acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, the heart, in my opinion, at this time would actually be more important to investigate than novel coronavirus. So when, uh, you know, everybody, when you guys are out in practice are going to be developing kind of your own um, clinical gestalt for how you decide what the differential is and what you want to order. And this takes time, you, you know, even a, a year and two months into it, I'm still, in my opinion, not, uh, not where I want to be. Um, but I like to go through this systematically, right? So Syncable episodes, we can think of uh, different causes for that. And if we're looking at this from an organ standpoint, you know, I like to go head to toe. So in a, in, it, when we're talking about the brain, obviously stroke is within the differential. Um, heart, you know, you're going to do a typical acute coronary syndrome workup. So you're thinking cardiogenic syncope, aortic injury, myocardial infarction, you know, things that could land you in the hospital, things that could kill you. And then as far as the lungs, obviously, you know that acute respiratory failure or ARDS is within the differential based on her history. But what are some other things that can cause syncope when, it, when you're dealing with cardiovascular and when you're dealing with pulmonary systems? So pulmonary embolism, pulmonary edema, and then obviously pneumonia is going to be in here. Um, so rather than have everybody kind of uh, shout out tests that we order, I would just kind of go through um, my thought process. Um, so like I said, uh, typical patients that come into the emergency department for an ACS rule out are going to get an EKG. You're going to get basic labs. Likely you'll be getting serial troponins um, unless the patient's history is really not that convincing. Um, at the end of the day, don't forget, guys, that you are, are clinicians and you're supposed to be critically thinking first before we go to the labs. Um, one of the most important reasons why you need to be getting into that mindset is each facility that you're going to be working at could be drastically different from an academic center that you've been spending your rotations. So you're, you're, you're going to be limited in what you can order depending on where you're at in the country. And at the end of the day, you know, your brain is the best tool that you have. Um, serial troponins, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, you know, if it's a patient that says, Hey, I, you know, at 6am I was lifting boxes at my job and I started having a twinge of chest pain and that was nine hours ago. And now I've come to the ER. You probably don't need to Delta trope them unless you're really that worried about getting sued. Um, and then you're going to get a chest x-ray as well for all of your cardiac rule outs. Um, tachycardia. So some patients like to add a magnesium or a TSH if we're thinking that arrhythmia is part of the reasons why they, you know, they're in the emergency department. Um, and then let's talk about the D-dimer. Uh, and then we can kind of open this up um, to conversation here. Who would order a D-dimer in this situation? Let's see if I can expand this to see the chat. Uh, I can't, uh, but is the majority saying yay or nay, Kristen? They're not saying anything. Okay, don't. Maybe uh, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, don't be afraid to, uh, you 50-50 chance, right? So, <laughs> oh, here we go, chat. Okay, Eric says, I wouldn't. Nicole says, probably go to further imaging if that worried. Good, based on well score. Okay, so. Rangel already knows that this patient can't be perked out um, based on what you know in the history. You probably can't perk this person out. Uh, if you're going to go to a well score, the score is actually probably going to be pretty low. Um, you have a, uh, you know, a high clinical suspicion for possibly pulmonary embolism. They'll get a point for that. The patient is 48, so they're not going to get points for age. And their past medical history really doesn't allude to anything that would tell you that, uh, that this would be the number one diagnosis. But this person did have a syncopal episode. They came from a nursing home where coronavirus is running rampant. Um, I would go straight to the CTA. So from an emergency medicine standpoint, you know, your D-dimer is not a great test. 
uh, it's going to be elevated any time that you have patients that are suffering from any type of, you know, malady that's going to cause acute phase reactants to increase. Um, really, the only time you want to use this is when you're in a gray area or you're on the border about your diagnosis and you're trying to prove that they don't need to be in the emergency department to not get the CTA. We call that the D-dimer game. Um, there's a lot of caveats that go into that as well. You know, in, in age-adjusted D-dimers, your patients who are in their 90s are always going to have an elevated D-dimer. Pregnant women are always going to have an elevated D-dimer. Um, if I do a blood draw on somebody and do a blood test and do a D-dimer, there's a chance it could be elevated just because of that. Um, so I think it's a pretty crappy test, uh, but it is good when it comes to essentially getting to the point where you need to dispo the patient and you don't want to do expensive imaging. Um, but everybody here is pretty much on board. Uh, they would skip the D-dimer because one, you don't want to wait around for that number to come back before ordering a CTA on somebody who went into arrest. And uh, again, think in terms of, well, what if I had to pay out of pocket for all of the tests that are being ordered on me? Um, you know, we, we talk about the cost of healthcare in this country, and this is just one thing that you can do to help affect that. And that's by being a better clinician and not being the type of provider that's going to order a million tests because we're not, you know, because we don't trust the training that we got and our own clinical gestalt. So let's not forget about the whole coronavirus thing. She's going to get respiratory panel. She's going to get a PCR test for SARS-CoV-2. Um, a venous blood gas it provides you a lot of information, and I think that's reasonable. And luckily, in my emergency department, um, we can do bedside venous blood gas with a lactate if you're really worried about sepsis. But aside from tachycardia, she is not really presenting with any other SERS criteria. The procalcitonin um, is either loved or hated by the hospitalists that you're ultimately going to be admitting to. Um, uh, basically, a procal, again, not a great test, but if elevated, can help you differentiate between a viral uh, pneumonia or a bacterial pneumonia. In bacterial pneumonia, the procal is going to be elevated. Uh, so as far as imaging, uh, you know, we kind of jumped the gun here. Everybody, I think, is on board with wanting to order a CTA. Um, more specific than a CT scan in which things could get missed in a chest x-ray pretty good for showing you uh, basic cases of pneumonia, um, but in this situation, it could also be beneficial uh, to get just a spot, you know, plain chest in the room if you have portable radiology at your disposal. That way you can assess for things like pulmonary edema, you can see if they have a pleural effusion. Um, you can also, you know, take a look at, at what the heart is doing. Most of the time, it's not going to be exciting, but who knows? You know, if you're seeing extravasation of blood on the aortic knob, um, that's when you should start sweating a lot and uh, start to call a medevac to take them to a higher level of care. Um, static cardiogram, well, that's probably a given based, that, uh, based on the fact that the patient had to get uh, shocked by the AED, so we ordered that as well. Um, Let's see here. Is there anybody here that would, you know, order an MRI? Please say no. Okay, great. Uh, MRIs are one of those things where they're super expensive and not necessary to order in this situation. Um, the only reason why I would ever order an MRI is if a neurosurgeon yells at me and tells me he wants one, or if I have high suspicion for some sort of, you know, central nervous or peripheral nervous injury, um, which we're not seeing. She's got no focal neurological deficits. So this is the EKG that comes out. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to take a look at that. And uh, feel free to utilize the chat if you see anything alarming um, that should raise an eyebrow. I'll give you a hint. There's nothing alarming in the CKG except for tachycardia. Um, you're not seeing tombstoning. You're not seeing global ST elevation. You're not seeing hyperacute T waves. Um, everything looks fine. Doesn't look like there's an arrhythmia here. Um, so this is weird, right? In a patient that you know had an AED applied to them, they got shocked twice. They had epinephrine to return to ROSC. The EKG looks pretty good. Um, so we'll just keep that on the back burner. So this is a board exam teaching point. 
Uh, who remembers the classic EKG findings of a pulmonary embolism? Okay, so Abby's got it. Tyler, not the specific answer I was looking for, but tacky is definitely something that you would look for for somebody suffering a PE. That's actually probably one of the first things you would look for. All right, S1, Q3, T3. Um, so everyone is doing their board exam studying. That's good. So you're going to see a deep S wave in lead one, uh, Q waves in lead two, sorry, three, and an inverted T wave in lead three. Um, S1, Q3, T3, from a board standpoint, is good to know. After that, really doesn't mean anything. Uh, I have yet to see this type of EKG finding on any of my patients that I've been able to diagnose with a pulmonary embolism. So in the real world, I don't really care about this. It's not specific, um, and it's not a sensitive test for PE. You're still going to have to diagnose with a CT scan, um, but good to remember for the board exam. And you only find this in 20% of the patients that have a PE. Um, but you know, when you're in the field, if you stumble upon a classic finding, it's good to grab a copy of that EKG so you can prove to your students that you'll be mentoring in the future that it does exist. So labs come back. And again, um, rather than have you kind of read through the minutia, I've just highlighted things in red. These are the things you care about. Oddly enough, uh, a patient suffering from what we presume to be an acute respiratory distress syndrome uh, doesn't have, you know, leukocytosis, doesn't have a left shift. Um, some people might look at her hemoglobin hematocrit and say she's anemic. Well, technically you're right, but I don't care as unless your number is below seven and I have to give you blood. Not that big of a deal. Um, but we did order the D-dimer um, and it's greater than 20. And we'll talk a little bit about the significance of an elevated D-dimer in novel coronavirus cases and take a look at the, you know, the liver transaminases. These are sky high. Uh, now this patient is 48. Uh, is she a drinker? Maybe, um, but let's not, you know, rush to an assumption that she's an alcoholic and that's why she passed out. Uh, the history at this point in time is still more concerning for the fact that she's been around a bunch of patients that have novel coronavirus. Um, so that's still the tunnel that we're going to travel down. CT angiogram comes back. Uh, so take a look at that. Um, what are you guys seeing in this slice? Your initial reaction when seeing the slide should be, this looks like shit, and you're right. Um, but go ahead and try to get, take a guess at what you're looking at. Quentin's got it. Or I guess he's asking. So yes, that is a, so next time, Quentin, just say ground glass appearance, be confident. You, you knew what it was. You don't need my confirmation for it. That's right. So yeah, what you're seeing is ground glass appearance. Now, ground glass opacity on a CT scan in and of itself is not a, a slam dunk diagnosis for novel coronavirus, um, but it is telling you that you have lung damage. Um, and you're seeing that a lot. We're seeing that a lot in, in COVID-19 cases. So it's not specific uh, for SARS-CoV-2. If you're going to talk to a radiologist, they're just going to tell you that lung damage is lung damage until proven otherwise. And uh, it's almost a slam dunk finding based on the patient's history, but you could see ground glass opacity for a number of different reasons. All right. So uh, keep in mind that uh, you, you, you guys are trained as generalists. Um, you're probably in the mindset now where you still want to fix every single problem that the patient has. But keep in mind that you're in the emergency department. So what's the next step? The patient is hemodynamically stable, okay, and talking. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and let you know what I would do next. I would pick up the phone and I would call the hospitalist. It's time to get admitted. So this is the beauty of working in the emergency department is I don't need to fix everything. I just need to prove that they need to be in the hospital so somebody smarter than me fixes it. 
Um, and also there is, uh, you know, for me, I've always been an instant gratification person. So for the lack repairs that come in, for the patients that have easy diagnosis, uh, that makes my job pretty rewarding. Um, but I don't, you know, maybe, maybe you guys are different. I don't lose sleep at night after I admit a patient to the hospital as thinking, man, what could I have done to, to fix all of their different problems? Um, but you know, that's, that's more of a personality thing. Um, if you're like that, then maybe ER is where you should be. If you're, if you're not like that, if you, you know, really want to, to dive into optimizing, you know, the treatment for your patient, making sure that they have all of their meds in row, making sure that they're continued with follow-up resources, then maybe the hospital's route is the way that you want to go. Uh, just don't yell at me when I call you to admit a patient, because I do that a lot. All right, so back to the heart issue. So what about the whole getting shocked twice in Ross thing? Um, you know, we, we did a workup. Uh, the initial troponin was not elevated. BNP was not elevated. We didn't see anything really special on the EKG. Uh, we did an echocardiogram, and now that they're being admitted to the hospital, they're going to get a cardiology consult. Um, should we still be worried about, you know, or should we at least be asking, well, you know, if this is a novel coronavirus case, then why did she have to get two shots from the AED? Who's still, you know, worried about that or who's still at least perplexed about that? So this is a rare finding in a patient who's otherwise young and previously healthy, suffering from COVID-19. Um, cardiology consult would later come back to you and let you know that based on what they saw in the echocardiogram, uh, the patient had left heart strain and was suffering from stress cardiomyopathy. And this is also known as Takatsubo's cardiomyopathy. Um, has anybody done a cardiology rotation yet? Great. Uh, so let's see, Abby, McConan, and Sam. Uh, bonus points. What does Takatsubo stand for? There you go. Nicole's got it. Octopus trap. Uh, and then also named after the, the Japanese clinician that kind of discovered the disease. Um, <clears throat> now, from an ER standpoint, there's nothing that I would be doing to try to manage Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. It's just one of those weird things where stress causes the heart to uh, essentially have worsening failure and in some cases arrest. Um, we joke uh, about a patient that I had, I think six months ago, where she came in with a negative ACS rule out. She had delta troponins that were negative. She had no cardiac history that would really increase her risk or her heart score, uh, which if you're familiar with Barbara Backus, you'll know what that is. And we can talk about the heart score at the end of the lecture. Um, but the ER was hot and we had a lot of people coming in. I think I had a trauma coming in and my attending told this lady, you know, we essentially need to dispo you because we have a trauma coming in and we need the room. Two days later, we find out that that uh, particular patient ended up going into VTAC arrest and was seen at a different hospital, and that was due to Takatsubo's cardiomyopathy. So I always joke with my attending that uh, based on you kicking her out of the ER too early, you broke her heart, and that's why she ended up having to get admitted two days later. Um, but, you know, this is one of the things about this particular case that I thought was incredibly interesting. Um, does coronavirus cause Takatsubo's cardiomyopathy? Probably not, but in this position, in this particular patient, it did. And then again, why didn't we see certain lab and EKG findings in this particular case? In most cases of Takatsubo's, you would expect to have an elevated troponin, an elevated BNP. You would expect to see ST segments that were elevated on the EKG, but in this particular case, we did not. And the truth of the matter is that I have no idea why we didn't see these findings. You know, not everything is going to be picture perfect. It's not going to be textbook. Uh, but that's the reason why you order additional testing like an echocardiogram so that you can get a specialist on board to help you determine the best, you know, treatment modality for the patient. Okay, so uh, again, there, COVID-19, in my opinion, is one of these illnesses that is just, it's too new, 
for me to be able to sit on a pulpit as a provider that's only been working for a year and, and two or three months to say, well, this is what the experts know about COVID-19. Um, the disease is too new. There's still a lot of data out there that needs to be collected and a lot of studies that need to be peer reviewed before we start telling our patient population, you know, with, with uh, 100% certainty that these are the things to look for. So one of the challenge, one of the many challenges that this particular cohort is going to face is when you get into the field, because you end up earning that C at the end of your name, you now have a title and a responsibility to, to, to do due diligence to your patients, um, which means that you're going to have to do a lot of extra work to make sure that you're really critically thinking about the data that's coming out and making a determination to figure out if this is information that can be safely communicated to your patient population because they're depending on you for it. You know, they trust you. So let's talk about a couple of things that have been going out on television and on the media and on the internet. So specific lab findings, and this is per up to date, is these are some things that you should expect to see in COVID-19 patients, but that's not true 100% of the time. This patient that we talked about didn't have an elevated lactate dehydrogenase. She didn't have lymphopenia, but she did have elevated liver transaminase levels. And that's why I highlighted those back earlier in the presentation so that you would remember that. Um, would she have an elevated CRP uh, or SED rate? Probably, but those tests are complete garbage. And the only reason why you would ever order those is for, you know, one, if you were suspicious of infection and the rest of the lab work wasn't convincing enough for you to admit, uh, or if you had a patient that was complaining of blurry vision, a temporal headache, and jaw claudication, uh, who has an idea of what disease I'm talking about when I mentioned those clinical symptoms. I think I even mentioned, there we go, All right, temporal arteritis. Good. Um, so another thing to keep in mind is clinical manifestations per up-to-date. So based on what we're seeing so far, 99% of your patients are going to have a fever. This one did not. Uh, and you're going to see fatigue, dry cough, anorexia, myalgias, dyspnea, sputum production. This sounds kind of like the seasonal flu, right? Um, so this could be, you know, at the detriment of your clinical gestalt, don't be concerned or super worried that you're going to miss a COVID-19 case. Um, if they're not sick enough to be in the hospital, if they're afebrile, if they're asymptomatic, or if their symptoms are minor, then who cares if they have novel coronavirus, right? They're, uh, they're not at risk of being intubated. They're not sick enough to be in the hospital. You're going to have to give them information on, on quarantine, probably, because you don't want them going to visit their grandmother in a nursing home or somebody who is at high risk for mortality due to this. But other than that, I'm sure that in this valley, I have probably sent home half a dozen patients that probably would test positive for novel coronavirus, but they just weren't sick enough to be in the ER. So, it, you know, more quick lessons on critical thinking. So here's one of the things that has been, you know, touted in the media. Our own president was talking about it. You know, Plaquenil and azithromycin can help to treat COVID-19. And I think there's a, a primary care doctor out in New York who claims to have cured 700 plus patients by giving them this therapy. Is that true? Probably not. Um, so you're thinking, well, wh why in God's name would we be giving, you know, hydroxychloroquine and an antibiotic for a viral illness? That doesn't make sense, right? So no, there's no evidence to suggest that antimalarials and antibiotics are effective in treating a viral upper respiratory disease. However, maybe hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin also have anti-inflammatory qualities. So if your patients come in with a novel coronavirus infection and they're riddled with uh, inflammatory reactants in a cytokine storm like tumor necrosis factor, um, maybe these medications can actually help to mitigate the symptoms. Um, so again, at face value, this seems like a ridiculous thing to do, but if your patient is in the hospital and you're having trouble extubating them because they're still ill, this could be something that you could potentially try on them. 
Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has heard this over in the Midwest, but now they're starting to have studies saying that Losartan and lisinopril can help treat COVID-19. What do you guys think about that one? I would love to know the mechanism of action. We will get into it. So this is one of the more interesting things, Dr. Lugo. So, right, why would we ever use an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin renin blocker? There, Eric. So Eric has been doing some extra reading on, on coronavirus. So he's talking about the ACE2 receptor, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, so maybe. SARS-CoV-2 pathway of infection has been determined to be the ACE2 receptor. And if we utilize medications that block these receptors, then the virus won't have a route to infiltrate the cell and reduce the severity of the disease. They have done studies on SARS-CoV-1 that actually might support this hypothesis. Uh, and again, maybe not, because if we remember uh, what very little we tried to cram into our brains from, from neuro and from Oh, hold on, the chat's blowing up. Okay, uh, anyway, if we basically remember, uh, you know, our pathophys uh, as a tribute to, uh, as a tribute to, you know, to your, your pathophys lectures that I can never replicate Dr. Vasilov, we'll have one quick slide where we talk about the pathway, or at least the, the theory behind the hypothesis. So this is your RAS activating system. You have angiotensinogen. When your blood pressure is uh, detected to be too low by your kidneys, it releases renin. Renin converts angiotensinogen into, uh, into AT1. And then after that, you have uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, which turns that into AT2. Um, basically, what you're looking at here is the pathway. And if you have high levels of AT2, you're gonna have high levels of the ACE2 receptor, which causes vasoconstriction, increased blood pressure, increased vascular permeability, which results in pulmonary edema and ARDS. If it's low, you're gonna release aldosterone, which decreases potassium and increases your sodium, your blood pressure uh, will go up, um, but also increases vasodilation and it decreases inflammation. So the theory behind this is that if you're going to use lisinopril or losartan to downregulate your ACE2 receptors, then you have less routes of infection for the novel coronavirus. Um, there's still a lot of testing that needs to be done, but in murine models or in mice models, uh, what they're seeing, at least from the studies that were done on SARS-CoV-1, is that the symptoms were less severe. And then they even genetically modified mice to not have ACE2 receptors, and those mice ended up not getting infected. Uh, I, I will be interested in following this and seeing if we ever take this to human trials to really figure out if this is something that can be effective the next time a pandemic like this hits. Um, and again, you know, when you when you block a uh, an ACE2 receptor, the body is going to respond by upregulating it. So, it's well within reason to suggest that this could actually make your patients worse instead of better. Um, but again, this is one of those things where U.S. clinicians have to really look at the data that's being out there and critically think about, you know, what is the right advice that I should be giving my patient. Um, so, the the tip here is just to proceed with caution. Everybody wants to sound like they're correct. Everybody wants to be a, a subject matter expert. Everybody wants to help their patient. Um, but don't let pride or ego get in the way of doing what's right for the patient. And in this case, with novel coronavirus, it is more than acceptable to tell them, I don't know yet. Or the disease is still new. There's still a lot of research. Um, you know, these are the things that I would suggest, but these are definitely things that I wouldn't. So then wouldn't you think that the majority of hypertensive, hypertensive patients wouldn't develop symptoms of COVID because the majority of people are going to be on an ACE inhibitor? Um, it's well within reason to think that, but now what we're seeing is that, you know, hypertension along with diabetes, basically all of the things that you're used to seeing patients get admitted for, you know, uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, uh, 
COPD, congestive heart failure, these are all things that are going to increase your, your morbidity rate for SARS-CoV-2. And they increase your morbidity rate for pretty much any type of acute respiratory distress illness. Regular influenza would do the same thing. But if I'm on an ACE inhibitor and ACE or my ACE inhibitor is attacking um, AT2, then I really shouldn't even be infected with COVID. That's why I have trouble understanding where they're coming up with this because we have patients who are on ACE inhibitors who are developing symptoms of COVID and who are very ill. So if it if an ACE inhibitor worked, I would think those people wouldn't we wouldn't see them admitted. Right. And, uh, you know, and again, I don't know the, the direct answer to that question. Maybe these patients are having an upregulation in ACE2 receptors because they've been on lisinopril and losartan for a long time. Maybe they're, if they've been on these medications for several years, their bodies are already attenuated to taking those medications. Um, you know, as much as we dislike, uh, as much as we dislike, like the pandemic and the novel coronavirus, there is a little bit of respect that you have to give to the pathogen because of how elegant it is. So these are one of the more fun things that I like hearing in the emergency department. Um, you know, your patients are going to be coming in and say, well, I heard the virus was designed in a lab by China and I hate Chinese people now. Um, that's too bad. Uh, Probably not, uh, and I'm not saying this just because I'm Asian and one day I would like to be able to fly in an airplane without sneezing and being treated like a terrorist. Um, but again, the virus is just much too elegant for human minds to have created it, in, in my opinion. Um, and if it was created to end humanity, it's not doing a very good job. Uh, you know, the, the kill rate is just slightly over 2%. Uh, certainly, we can figure out a way, if we're going to design a virus to end humanity, certainly we can do better than that. Um, we actually had, uh, so, you know, don't report me to HIPAA, but we, you know, we do in this area in quote unquote free America, uh, we have patients that come into the ER. I had one lady come in, uh, because she was shopping at Costco, uh, asymptomatic with normal vitals, but she saw, I think two Chinese people, the aisle down purchasing a television and one of them seized and she wanted to get tested for coronavirus. Um, so in that situation, you, you have to find the most eloquent way of telling that person they're an idiot and discharging them so they, they, they one, don't take up resources in the ER, but then also don't report you to, uh, <laughs> but don't report you to, to uh, the, the, the patient satisfaction powers that be. The last thing that you want, uh, I work at a Catholic hospital, so the last thing you want is a bunch of nuns coming down, twisting your ear, saying that you need to be, you know, nice with patients. Um, and then the last one. The cure is worse than the disease. So I'm gonna leave that one out to the field. I, I'm not going to tell you uh, what you should think on this. Um, but what I will tell you is that, you know, nothing, a pandemic like this that affects people from both a health standpoint and from a financial standpoint, this is all happening in concert. You know, nothing is isolated and one problem is not going to be completely isolated from other problems that I think we need to be taking a further look at. So yeah, you're at the, at the core, at the end of the day, you guys are physician assistants. Your job is to practice medicine, but your job is also to look out for the best interests of your patients. Um, and there are other things that can kill you than coronavirus. Um, and, you know, luckily none of us in this, in this channel, hopefully has ever you know, really, really struggled with poverty. None of us have ever had to dig through the garbage to, to find their next meal. None of us have ever, you know, hopefully had to, to struggle paycheck to paycheck, but a lot of your patients are going to be in this situation where their businesses have closed, they've lost their job, they're eager to go out and work and earn money, but they're being told by the, the people who know best, AKA you and I, that they need to hunker down and stay, in, stay inside their homes. Well, how long should they be doing that? And the answer is, as I don't know. Um, I don't think that we should be hiding from this thing forever. And ultimately, you know, if this affects the, the country or the world from an economic standpoint where, you know, people are not able to make rent or not able to put food on the table, then there are other things that are going to be affecting your patients that 
could potentially be worse than, you know, infection from coronavirus. Uh, it, depression rates are starting to climb. Um, we're already starting to see increased domestic violence rates, in, at least in the area that I live in, uh, which is kind of sad. You know, as somebody who still believes in the sanctity of marriage, it's unbelievable that, it, you know, you're, you're forced to spend one month in quarantine with your husband or wife, and all of a sudden you find out that's not, you know, you can't, you can't stand them anymore. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, but depression rates and calls into the suicidal hotlines have also increased dramatically. Um, so keep, you know, keep that in mind when you're trying to give advice about, about how to handle this disease to your patient population. Um, and that's just kind of my two cents about that. Okay, so uh, no uh, presentation from an ER provider is, uh, is enjoyable without some extra things that you'll see in the ER. Uh, these are just some bonus cases uh, that I've had, you know, in my year in practice. Um, so this gentleman was teaching his 11-year-old son how to clean a gun for the first time. And uh, lesson number one, always make sure that the chamber is empty. He ended up firing a 9-millimeter bullet into his finger. Uh, you know, how would Melissa Bowlby name this fracture? <laughs> so uh, I would just say, you know, if you're calling an orthopedist or a hand specialist, you're just going to tell them what happened and say there's a, a grossly comminuted fracture of the proximal first phalanx. Um, luckily enough, this patient, I think, ended up getting salvaged. Uh, what you're looking at uh, is the entry wound and the exit wound. And uh, the little white thing that you're seeing in the third picture, that's his extensor tendon uh, that he was still able to use. Uh, so from an ER standpoint, he's not grossly bleeding. I gave him a digital block in order to help him with his pain. I also gave him a ton of morphine. Um, and then he ended up getting seen by a hand specialist. So we put down a couple of stitches to tack it together, and then you wrap it wet to dry. And the specialist, uh, because he was too lazy to come in at the time of the injury, said, let me see him in clinic, and uh, we'll fix it tomorrow morning. And that's what we did. All righty. Here's another fun one. So uh, this gentleman actually was on the FBI terrorist list. He was making pipe bombs in his bathroom. And, uh, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. So yeah, he ended up having to get his, uh, his hand amputated. Uh, there's no salvaging that. I would have taken a picture of the actual hand, but uh, it was pretty disgusting. And there was a ton of people in the room, and I didn't want to make a spectacle of it, but these are the plain films. Um, so, yeah, the, the lesson is, one, don't be a terrorist. And, two, don't make homemade explosives in your home. Things, bad things are probably going to happen. Uh, I think later on, they actually found out he had a second one that he had planted at a park. Um, they actually used like a bomb detection robot to go out and retrieve it. But that one luckily did not go off. All right. This one is not as grotesque, but this is actually a really super rare finding. Um, I'll go ahead and leave this open to the field. Who wants to tell me what is wrong with this patient's hand or wrist? Let's just say that one of these bones is not placed correctly where it's supposed to be. There we go. Katie's got it. So you'll see scaphoid fractures, but in this particular case, the patient was riding a motorbike and supermaned over the handlebars, landed on a foosh fall, and he has a scaphoid lunate dissociation. Um, based on what the orthopedists and what my attendings tell me, this is probably the only time that, I, that I'm ever going to see this case. Uh, this is actually a complex hand surgery. It takes hours to fix this. Um, but I just thought that was interesting. So, uh, And one of the things about working in the emergency department is, unfortunately, there is a dark side to working in the ER. You know, if you decide to go in the emergency department, you're going to see a lot of abuse cases as well. Um, and that's just something that I want you guys to be cognizant of when you're going out into the field, even if you're not in emergency medicine. Um, you know, it's your job to, to cure the disease or to treat the ailment, but it's also your job to look out for your patients. So in this one year old, uh, you know, essentially he was throwing a little bit of tantrum. The dad got upset, poured hot soup on his arm. 
Um, so this is one of those cases where, you know, what else do I need to be doing as an ER provider? So you have to call, uh, you know, child services, you have to call the police, you have to be able to be brave enough to get them involved um, to make sure that you're taking care of this kid. And I think if we, if we look at the trends in the ER when it comes to child abuse and also when it comes to domestic violence, which is almost a majority of the time entirely directed towards the female, 30% um, of these cases come into the emergency department and nothing happens uh, before the, the, the patient succumbs to, to homicide. Um, and that's not acceptable. Okay. So if you have hair that's, you know, standing up on your forearm or the back of your neck, then don't be afraid about being wrong because the, the results of missing something like this could end up in a kid or, you know, a young woman losing their life. Um, so keep that in mind when you're out there in the field. This one I think is just a neat uh, CT scan. So this is a, a very sweet 78 year old female comes into the emergency department, says every time I eat, I throw up. Um, this is, if you've seen a lot of CT, CT scans, this should be pretty obvious. Just a few Quentin, right? You, you almost wanna take the gallbladder out and play marbles with those things. Um, so oddly enough, she's not, you know, you don't see gallbladder thickening and she's not uh, with fever and she doesn't have an elevated white count. So right now she's still an elective surgery patient. She could live like this. Just don't eat fried chicken or else you're going to be in for a bad time. All right. So we have, uh, I've almost exhausted my time, um, but we still have 10 minutes left. So Tips for new graduates. So when is the best time to start job hunting? That was three months ago. Uh, if you haven't started, you guys need to get really, really, really aggressive. Um, you know, we, we talk about kind of the challenges that each cohort has faced uh, in this program, which is still, you know, very young. You know, the class of two, 2017, they were the pilot class, um, but they were also the first class to have a 100% pants rate. Uh, the class of 2018, well, we tried our best. Uh, 2019, you know, they were the first class to never lose a student. Um, but in my opinion, the class of 2020, and while I don't know you guys very well, you will have to battle probably more adversity than any of the other cohorts behind you. And the reason why I say that is because this is unprecedented, right? You have a global pandemic that has affected your education. It's taken you off of clinical rotations, which one is a detriment to your training and it also hurts your networking. Um, and you're also going to be entering the job market during essentially what is going to be a recession. Um, you're already seeing now that healthcare systems are cutting physician salaries. A lot of patients, uh, sorry, not patients, but a lot of staff is being furloughed um, and budgeting is down. Not to, you know, to give you a, the world is, you know, the sky is falling scenario, but this is something that you're going to have to face, you know, as a cohort that's going to be ready to hit the field and the market might not be ready for you yet. Um, so, one, schedule your board examination as soon as possible um, because time spent not working is time that you're not earning income. And all of you, unless you're you know, sitting on oil money or something, are going to have loans to pay off. Uh, so save as much money as possible. You, you have to be as frugal as possible. Um, and you know, I, I don't want you to, to not have your, the occasional pumpkin spice latte or avocado toast, but you really got to figure out what you got to sacrifice because one, the pants is $500 licensing and certification is going to cost you money. And again, the job offers I can only assume are not as uh, abundant as they were for my cohort. And they're not as abundant as they were for the 2017 cohort. Oh, and I guess the 20, I always forget about the 2019 cohort and the 2019 cohort. Um, another thing that I would advise is that you have all of your supplementary documentation prepared before you hit the job field. And what do I mean by that? So prior to applying, I made an effort to digitize everything, resumes, transcripts, um, driver's license, social security cards, and you want that easily accessible by your employer uh, because when you credential, that process takes three to four months. So even after you get the job acceptance, 
you're still not gonna be working for a really long time and you wanna speed that up as much as possible. Because again, time spent not working is time spent not earning money that you could be using. One, because you guys deserve it because you've worked your asses off. And two, you, you know, you have loans to pay back. So, uh, you know, life pro tip, make the, make the life of the administrator or the HR professional easier for you by digitizing everything. I have everything stored in a G drive and I give them access to it. That way they don't call me 50 times a day saying, hey, we didn't receive your, your transcript for your PA program or we're still waiting for your CV or your driver's license. It's all there for them. Um, and the response that I've gotten from at least my first employer is that one, not a lot of people do that. And two, um, if you do do that, it makes things a lot faster for you. Uh, and then again, don't be afraid to work a more humbling job before you land your first gig as a, as a PA. Uh, you don't know how long that's going to take. I remember for three months, I think for three or four months after graduation, I worked at a grocery store to pay rent. Um, and yeah, it's humbling. It's humbling to, to be a freshly uh, minted certified physician assistant with a master's degree going into a grocery store saying, hey, I'll take any job that you have for me. Um, but there are benefits to that as well. One, you guys are probably mentally exhausted from having to study medicine for the last 27 months. Um, and it is nice to get a little bit of a break. It is nice to actually kind of root yourself in, in manual labor or regular work, quote unquote, regular work, uh, to get an appreciation for what you will be doing in the future. And in my situation, find something that you've always been interested in doing that you didn't have time to do when you were in PA school. I had never learned how to bake bread before. I learned how to bake bread in the grocery store and now I can bake bread. Um, you know, so just kind of keep that in mind as you're, as you're going through the, all of the, the additional hoops and, and, uh, and, and, you know, gates that you're going to have to cross as you get closer to graduation. Um, so that's kind of my soapbox. And uh, I'll just open that up to questions and answers. Um, feel free to ask me questions about what it's like to be a PA in the ER. Yes, you should. You can and should be asking questions about compensation. Um, a lot of people don't like to talk about money. Um, I do. I think it's fun to talk about it. I think it's one of those things that keeps people motivated. Uh, and then this is a picture of my dog. His name's Freud. Uh, you know, animal adoption, that's one good thing about the pandemic is animal adoption has increased because of it. And I got lucky to pick this guy up about two and a half weeks ago. So um, I do have access to the chat now. So, you know, if you guys want to talk on your mic or if you want to just type a question, I'll try my best to answer it in the order that they come. Um, I didn't rely on the AAPA salary report. Uh, I, I think AAPA has good intentions. Um, I think the salary report is probably one of the one of the best things that you could be giving your money to them for. Um, but they have also, I, I have a love hate relationship with AAPA. Yes, I think you should support the organization because they represent us. I think they need better leadership. Um, I know you guys are all aware that they recently spent a million dollars on a study to determine what our title should be and Praxition was one of them, and that's ridiculous. Uh, so, you know, I, to, to answer your question directly, I did not use the salary report. I kind of looked at other, I asked other people in the field what they were making, and I based my number off of that. Uh, advice for looking and applying for jobs out of state. Sam, if you know somebody, that's going to be the best way in. Um, there are a litany of different online websites that you can be used. I think there's one that's directed specifically towards physicians. Um, but I was lucky in that I had family members that were associated with the hospital and that's how I got my in. Um, so I would co probably communicate with the, with the members of the other cohorts because that's going to be your closest link. And it's going to be a lot more effective than trying to apply online because the online application process right now is probably flooded with not only you guys, but nurse practitioners. Um, and also is uh, not an effective way to get your face in front of somebody. Uh, PA practice being limited in the Pacific Northwest. Actually, no. Um, Ohio is super saturated with nurse practitioners. 
And the closer they get to autonomous practice, which in my in my opinion is not is it, it's an inevitability. It is going to happen. Um, so for those of you looking to get into primary care, you know, from a market standpoint, that's going to be one of the biggest threats to your entry into the job market. Uh, so in the Pacific Northwest, I, I, I find that PAs are actually more better utilized. And from a pay standpoint, we also make a lot more money. Um, so I think if you're looking to get out here, at least in the Washington, Idaho, Utah area, I think PAs actually have more of a foothold than other APPs. Uh, Katie, yes, uh, I'll just have Dr. Lugo send my email out um, to everybody. That way you can send me questions. Uh, Quentin, any tips when trying to sell yourself as a new PA looking for a job? Um, same mentality, I think, that you had when you were applying for PA school, right? So, yeah, you're a brand new provider. Uh, and obviously, all of you guys are going to be lacking experience. Um, but what I would backpedal on that to anybody who's looking to hire you is, one, you don't have bad habits yet. Um, so if you are lucky enough to meet the right type of attending physician that wants to train you like you're their resident, and actually I would say that, I want you to treat me like a resident. Um, but you're a resident that never leaves, right? So that's one of the benefits of being a PA is that they're gonna be able to mold you, um, you know, the right way and train you the right way and teach you good habits. Uh, and again, because of the way that the market is, you know, salary might not be something that you're gonna be able to, to negotiate for. Um, so again, you don't, uh, you know, if you get an offer that is in like the low 70s, then don't immediately turn your nose at that. A job is a job. And right now you guys are, are you know, most of you are in the red, uh, as am I, because I'm still paying loans off. So you need to have some sort of foothold in that first start and you need to have some sort of income. So I guess I'll uh, just go ahead and, and, and end the lecture now just by saying thanks for your time. I know that the, you, know, you have lots of ways to spend your time when you're uh, quarantined. Um, feel free to send me any questions via email. Uh, certainly when you guys come closer to graduation, um, if I can help you get a job, I certainly will. But again, my hospital's on a hiring freeze. Um, hopefully you guys got something out of the lecture more than just ClinMed and, and information about coronavirus. And again, uh, like I said, you guys, I think, are, are going to be probably the toughest PA class after you battle through all of this adversity. And I'm looking forward to hearing about your success in the future.